The Christmas story is shrouded in mystery and surrounded by many fascinating questions. Especially interesting is the account in the Gospel of Matthew that tells of wise men, visitors from far away, who had come to honor Jesus and how they found him by following a star in the sky. Study of this scripture has raised several questions. When was Jesus born? Is there any historical evidence for the census Luke reports that brought Mary and Joseph to Bethlehem? Who were the wise men that came to worship Jesus? What was the star in the sky that led the wise men to Jesus? If you had been alive then and knew what to look for, would you have seen the same heavenly manifestation that led them to the place of Jesus' birth? The Christmas story is a familiar one. Mary and Joseph had been forced to travel by royal decree even though they were expecting a baby. They were desperate for a place to stay the night in Bethlehem. They slept in a stable because there was no room for them in the inn. When Jesus was born, his mother laid him in the animal's feeding trough because she had no cradle. Shepherds came from nearby fields, sent by angels who appeared and announced the birth of the Savior, Christ the Lord. Wise men, guided by a star, came with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Naturally, the investigation begins with the Bible, but there is surprisingly little mention of the Christmas event in the Bible. Of the four Gospels, only two, Luke and Matthew, mention Christ's birth. The second chapter of Luke tells how Mary and Joseph traveled from Galilee in the north to Bethlehem in the south to comply with a census decree from Rome. And Matthew recounts the tale of the wise men, or magi, foreigners who had traveled countless miles to see Jesus. The Gospel of Matthew does not provide much information about the Magi, and the other Gospels do not mention them at all. Still, they capture the imagination, often envisioned as foreign kings with exotic animals and clothing. We can be sure they were astrologers who paid close attention to the stars for signs and revealed knowledge. They gained an international reputation for their highly regarded use of astrology, considered a leading science of the time. The Magi were probably also ambassadors of some kind. In the Parthian Empire, the Magi made up one house of the government. But Magi weren't found only in Parthia. They were found everywhere. Matthew's Magi may have come from Parthia, just across the eastern border, or from far away. Some have proposed that the Magi set out from Babylon because there were many Jews still living there, and astrology had deep roots in that region. The Magi saw something in the sky they interpreted to mean that a significant royal birth had occurred in Jerusalem. So to Jerusalem they went. The Magi's path to Judea and Jerusalem brought them to Herod, king of the Jews. Herod was an extreme man, terrified of losing his power. He was very capable of ordering an execution to protect his throne. He had done so already, and would do so again. Herod, earlier in his career, had been a person of courage, and a person whose, whose efforts were uh, crowned with great success. But as the years went on, he began to be fearful that people, especially people in his own realm, were plotting to overthrow him. So the fear grew and uh, evolved into a paranoia at the end of his life. Herod was not considered a real Jew by his people. He imposed his rule over his increasing realm with backing from the expanding Roman Empire. Augustus Caesar ruled as the most powerful man in the world, 
As Emperor of Rome, he exercised supreme and far-reaching power. It was he who ultimately commanded the Roman legions. Rome grew by subjugating nations, adding them to the empire. Herod secured his throne by shrewdly allying himself with Rome when Rome needed a local leader to challenge the Parthians, a threatening rival empire on the eastern border. After that, Herod was king of the Jews, and the biblical land of Israel was under Roman control. It was part of the Roman world when Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Herod gained his throne through shrewd politics and ruthless cunning. He would also use these to protect his power. Herod fooled the Magi. He deceived them to think that he too wanted to honor Jesus. He did not. He intended to kill him as soon as he was found. But Herod's plan failed. And being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. Joseph was warned also. He took Mary and the baby and fled. Herod ordered all male babies in and around Bethlehem to be killed, hoping to eliminate the king announced by the star. But Jesus was safe in Egypt and came back to Judea and then Galilee as a small child upon the death of Herod. Among the many miracles of Christmas, one of the most interesting is the star that led the Magi. What was it? When did it appear? What did it look like? It is possible to use historical documents and astronomy to investigate the nature of the star. But first, there must be a time frame to search. Amazingly, the year of Jesus' birth is not known. The year 1 AD was intended to mark the beginning of a new era, the year in which Christ was born or conceived. But this system was not devised until five centuries later. Its inventor, a monk named Dionysius Exiguus, Latin for Dennis the Short, calculated the year Jesus was born while working on a table of future Easter dates. How he arrived at his conclusion is unknown, making his calculations difficult to verify. Generally, scholars consider his work accurate to within a decade, placing the date of the Nativity sometime between 8 BC and 1 AD. Most historians have estimated the birth of Jesus at 7 or 6 BC. The Gospels of Matthew and Luke say Herod was on the throne at the time of Jesus' birth. Herod died shortly after. Determining when Herod died would provide the latest possible date for the Nativity. An ancient historian named Josephus provided most of what is known about King Herod. But Josephus did not give the date or even the year of Herod's death. However, Josephus did record that a lunar eclipse preceded Herod's death and that the king was dead and buried by the following Passover. Historians have looked to astronomy to find that lunar eclipses occurred over Judea in 5 and 4 BC. The 5 BC eclipse has been ruled out due to the time of year it happened. Almost all have settled on 4 BC as the year of Herod's death. The Roman census provides another clue for determining the time of Jesus' birth. The Gospel of Luke mentions that Joseph was traveling to Bethlehem to comply with a census decree that all the world should be taxed. It also states that the census was the first when Quirinius was governor of Syria. 
the clues are all there. Finding a Roman census before 4 BC, matched with the date when Quirinius was governor of Syria, should provide the time frame for Jesus' birth. But there was no such census. Augustus' burial inscription proclaims his censuses of 28 BC, 8 BC, and 14 AD as events of which he was proud. None of these fit. If Herod died in 4 BC, the 8 BC census was probably too early. Also, Roman censuses and taxes only apply to Roman citizens. Joseph and Mary were not Roman citizens and would not have been subject to these. There are more problems. Quirinius, the Roman official noted in the Gospel of Luke, came into Syria in 6 AD. He came to conduct what was surely the first full Roman census for purposes of taxation in Palestine. He was taking over control from Herod's son Archelaus who had been a disaster as a ruler. But this census is a decade too late to fit with the death of Herod in 4 BC. Some historians question the historical integrity of the Gospels based on this evidence. Perhaps Luke was mistaken. Maybe Matthew's story should be taken as a legend which was never meant to be factual. But something isn't right. Early Christian witnesses all put Jesus' birth in 3 or 2 BC. That would mean Herod didn't die in 4 BC, but at least a year later. According to the historian Josephus, Herod captured Jerusalem 27 years from the city's fall to the Roman general Pompey. The conquest by Pompey happened on the Day of Atonement in 63 BC. Josephus means Herod captured Jerusalem on the Day of Atonement in the year 36 BC. Josephus also recorded that Herod ruled the Jews 34 years from the death of Antigonus, whom he had overthrown by capturing Jerusalem. Antigonus was taken into custody and killed some months later by order of the Roman commander Mark Antony. This puts Herod's death in or near 1 BC. There was also a lunar eclipse on January 10th, 1 BC. This eclipse was much more striking. The moon was totally engulfed in red light, unlike the eclipse of 4 BC. This historical and astronomical evidence suggests that Herod died in 1 BC, not 4 BC. One of the problems with the census? A closer look reveals that Luke's Gospel does not say that Caesar Augustus ordered a Roman census for taxation as sometimes translated. The word he used means registration. One would naturally think this was a census for taxes, but the possibility of some other kind of registration remains open. All the world was to be registered. There was a registration that took place in advance of February 5th, 2 BC. That date was the Silver Jubilee of Augustus in the 750th anniversary year of the founding of Rome. A loyalty oath was required of people throughout the empire citizens and non-citizens. Still, this registration happened before 6 AD when Quirinius became the governor of Syria, encouraging criticism that Luke must have been mistaken about the birth of Jesus. Again, the exact words in the Gospel of Luke are important. Luke wrote that Quirinius was ruling in Syria, but not necessarily that he was the governor. Later, Luke used the same word for Caesar himself. 
Luke certainly didn't mean Caesar was a governor. Roman records place Quirinius in Syria in or near 1 BC. He was in charge of teaching the emperor to be Gaius. Who was really ruling in Syria? Was it Gaius or his supervisor Quirinius? Surely in reality it was Quirinius and everyone knew it. Re-examining the date of Herod's death, the date and nature of the census, and whereabouts of Quirinius has opened a new window for the date of Jesus' birth, 3 and 2 BC. It isn't really new at all, because this is the same time window given by all the Christian witnesses of the first two centuries. What did the Magi see in the sky? What did they follow to Bethlehem? Did the star really move and stop in the sky? Several explanations have been offered. Some prefer to think of the star as purely miraculous, with no other explanation. But if the star was an astronomical event within God's plan, there exist a number of possibilities. A comet, a nova or supernova, a planet, or a conjunction involving planets or stars. If the Magi had looked up in the night sky in 3 or 2 BC, what would they have seen? The Star of Bethlehem is often depicted as a comet in paintings, with the tail pointing the Magi to the place of Jesus' birth. Such an explanation is possible, but unlikely. Comets were typically seen as bad omens, preceding war, or famine, or death. This is not fitting to mark the birth of the King of Kings. Novas and supernovas appear as intensely bright stars. Both occur at the end of a star's life. A nova is the brightening of a star while a supernova is the violent explosion of a star. These events are visible with the naked eye. Could the star of Bethlehem have been a nova? Probably not. The ancient Chinese kept records of such events, and no interesting novas or supernovas occurred during the years in question. Planets appear as stars to the naked eye. They are small, bright points of light. Unlike stars, their positions against the sky move from day to day. Because they wander, they were called by the Greek name planetes, wanderer. The star of Bethlehem might well have been a planet or group of planets. Modern astronomy can provide the locations of planets and interesting events in the night sky as they appeared thousands of years ago. Magi were interested in all these phenomena. There were two particular times when we know astrologers would have been watching the sky. Now they would have been interested in what was in the night sky any time of the night. But there were two particular times when we know that they would have been watching. One was before sunup and the other was right after sunset. This was because at those two times, it was possible to see what was in the sky around the sun before the bright sunlight washed it out in the morning or um, after the sunlight had subsided enough in the evening to allow people to see what was in the sky close to the sun. On August 12th, 3 BC, Jupiter and Venus gave the appearance of nearly fusing together as one in the sky. This conjunction of planets was quite striking. Jupiter and Venus are the brightest objects in the sky after the sun and moon. The possible meaning? Venus carried the connotation of mother. Jupiter was universally considered the planet of kings. 
the conjunction happened in the constellation Leo. An interested observer might conclude that a royal birth was about to happen somewhere governed by Leo. This conjunction was visible before dawn in heliacal rise, making it extremely important. Jupiter, like all the visible planets, moves eastward against the fixed stars through the year. On September 14th, 3 BC, Jupiter met the bright star Regulus in the constellation Leo. Regulus is one of just four stars that were thought to rule their quadrants of the sky. As the name implies, Regulus was associated with royalty. The king's planet and the king's star almost became one point of light, so close was their conjunction as viewed on Earth. Jupiter gradually moved past Regulus, but its sojourn in Leo was far from over. Jupiter reversed course and met Regulus again on February 17th, 2 BC. How can a planet reverse direction in the sky? It happens regularly. The visible planets all appear to stop in the sky, loop backward, stop, and then continue their usual forward motion. It is due to an optical illusion on the scale of our solar system. On May 8th, 2 BC, Jupiter and Regulus met a third time, suggesting to any astrologers influenced by Hebrew scripture that Shiloh, the Messiah, was near. On June 17th, 2 BC, Jupiter and Venus came together again in the sky, in a chronic rise over the western horizon after sunset. A significant part of the sky viewed at a significant time of day. A conjunction of these two planets occurred which has no equal for wonder and majesty. To the eye, the king's planet and mother planet became one. Conjunctions like this are centuries apart. Across the sky to the east, the full moon shone against this wondrous sight in the west. On December 25th, 2 BC, anyone in Jerusalem who happened to be awake and looking at the sky before dawn, the time when Magi were watching, would have seen Jupiter entering its next retrogression. In other words, it was coming to its full stop against the stars on that morning. And lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. At just this time, Jupiter was in a direction south-southwest, high above the horizon. Matthew says the Magi were in Jerusalem, ready to go to Bethlehem when they saw the star and rejoiced. It went before them and stood over the place where the child was, Bethlehem. From Jerusalem on that day and at that precise time, Jupiter was stopped in the sky, appearing to stand high above the small town of Bethlehem. What would the Magi have thought while observing these events? Anticipation, excitement, awe, and wonder. They were soon to meet the King of Kings, Lord of Lords, Wonderful Counselor, the Prince of Peace, Emmanuel. The Christmas star led the Magi to Jesus thousands of years ago. It is still commemorated today. It appears every Christmas, reminding us how Jesus Christ has emerged as the most important person in human history because of his lasting, life-changing influence, affecting more people than anyone else has. Augustus Caesar, once the most powerful man in the world, 
is mostly remembered as a footnote in the story of Christ's humble birth. Caesar's worldwide decree to honor himself set in motion the events leading to Jesus' humble birth in a stable, later culminating in his disgraceful death on a cross. The same gospel sources that recorded Jesus' birth also tell us that Jesus rose from the dead. In Christ, humility and love have far outlasted proud and mighty empires. Where the story of Jesus has been told faithfully, hatred has given way to compassion, ignorance has given way to learning, violence has given way to peace. Jesus ultimately gave his life for the world, God's unending Christmas gift.